tonight to hear the, you know, the other people that went um, to go on this trip. Um, but yeah, you'll hear about the system of actual detention in this country and how it is a brutal, torturous regime that locks up innocent people who are fleeing war and persecution. And the tragic truth is that many people who, after risking their own lives uh, for the hope of finding a better one here in Australia, end up actually taking their lives um, in desperation. Um, uh, you know, at their unjust imprisonment. Um, it is not just the particularly disgraceful and dehumanising way in which Serco treats refugees, nor is it just the long stretches of time that some of these refugees pass in utter desperation and confusion that makes the system so abhorrent. It is actually the very fact that people are locked up at all and punished for the crime of um, seeking a better life. And this is why I think RAN uh, will not tolerate any aspect of this system. Um, and we call for an end to all mandatory detention because no woman, man, or child should ever have to spend, spend like a single cent in any of these holes. Um, and I think you know this can seem very sort of maximal, but there's actually a really simple solution to this supposed uh, pro complex problem, um, and it's for refugees to just be processed in the community where they have access to all the services um, and. Uh, yeah, sorry, all the community services and um, help that they need, um, and that you know, anybody needs, but particularly people who are fleeing from war and, and persecution, and sometimes torture. Um, and so to varying degrees, this is actually how most of the world um, treats refugees. And in fact, Australia is the only country in the world that practices um, a policy of mandatory detention. However, the Australian government did not always treat asylum seekers like this, as many of you and remember. Um, uh, it was brought in by the Labor government in 1992 and prior to this Australia actually had a you know, fairly ordinary history of processing large numbers of refugees in the community. Um, for example, after the Vietnam War, uh, several thousand Vietnamese people fled by boat, and, and this wasn't uh, an outrage, um, to Australia's shores. And I have a quote from a, um, a RAC activist actually in Melbourne, um, RAC is sort of our sister organisation, the uh, Refugee Action Collective. Uh, he said, they were transferred directly to migrant hostels in the suburbs. Here they were free to come and go, to look for work and even to study at local colleges. They had health checks while they waited for the housing commission to find a place to live and for the immigration department to organise their permanent residency. So this was, you know, not a huge drama. Um, and Oxfam estimates that this crazy plan of treating human beings uh, like human beings would only cost about $63 per person per day. Uh, and in contrast to this, many of you would know just how costly the government's actual policy is. It's like outrageous. Um, you know, it's not just costly to the human beings who suffer um, under the system, but you know, massively um, costly uh, financially. So the government spends hundreds of millions of dollars every year to lock up refugees. Um, in 2007, Oxfam found that they spent uh, $1,830 per person um, per day to lock someone up in Christmas Island. Um, last year it was announced as well that the government wanted to spend $2.5 billion on offshore processing alone. Um, I'm just kind of reading out some figures because they're all appalling and all give a sense of just how much, you know, just the lengths that uh, the government is willing to go to to torture people. Um, and there's, you know, an $800 million five-year contract with Serco as well. Um, and so, by my calculations, it costs around 30 times more for the government to lock up refugees in prison than it would to provide them with all of those much-needed services. Um, so obviously, there have to be some benefits to this system um, if, if you know, people are willing to spend this much money on it. And I would argue that the benefits are not for refugees and not for ordinary people, but um, for the government. Uh, because obviously the, you know, the Labour Party and the Liberal Party uh, both use the refugee issue as uh, you know, a political football. Um, so the question becomes uh, not whether or not to deport a Tamil man to his death in Sri Lanka, but whether or not you'll be able to get one up on your political opponents if you send him to Sri Lanka to his death or not. Um, and I think broadly the usefulness of the policy is, is beyond just that kind of to and fro. Um, it's, it's scapegoating, basically. Um, so valid discontent from the from, you know, the Australian population about um, things like housing and uh, you know, lack of funding to um, education and health and all the kinds of things that you know, piss people off, rightfully so, um, instead they go, you know, go uh, 
uh, is directed towards refugees. Um, and it also, you know, uh, they're able to sort of drum up these racist views about refugees to justify spending millions of dollars on blocking them up. Um, and obviously it's self-fulfilling because then all this ensuing racist fear can lead to um, ideas that refugees are actually, you know, if we let them into the community, they would clog up all these schools and healthcare and, um, and things that people need. Uh, and so it leads to a sort of more popular demand for water protection and deterring refugees. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to just talk about, a little bit about Miranda and what our um, sort of approach is, which you know, Miranda went over. Um, but I think, uh, it, you know, to draw, it's, it's based around the idea that we can draw in and mobilise as many people as possible to challenge the system of mandatory detention. Um, and we think we can do this because we can, uh, or, you know, one of the reasons we do this rather is to uh, change the public opinion. Um, so we want to build a grass movement, uh, grassroots movement sorry, to reach as many people as possible. And we think that there's a large minority of people out there in the community who are, you know, maybe not pissed off, but actually don't kind of see any point to this system when the government could just be spending money on healthcare um, and things that it should. Um, yeah, and you know, polls show as well that the majority of the Australian government is actually to the left of the um, the. Sorry, the majority of the Australian population is to the left of the Australian government um, on things like offshore processing. So I think this gives you um, an indication of what we can achieve. Um, so yeah, Brown's role is you know, not just about visits and provide, providing care, but it's about uh, mobilising and challenging um, the system. And this can obviously you know, also put pressure on the government um, to end management detention. Um, and we want to sort of make it too hard and too expensive for them to keep on doing this. Um, yeah, but I think the, the only way that we can actually achieve any of these things and achieve our goal of ending mandatory detention forever is um, by drawing in like, lots and lots of people. Um, this is why we uh, you know, seek to hold big rallies. Um, so I'll just end by talking about you know, sort of why RAM came about, um, or why sort of the whole of the refugee rights campaign came about all over the country, which was in response to refugees themselves protesting in detention. And so our protests have always been in response to theirs and always been um, you know, a way of uh, a solidarity, basically, with um, you know, people protesting their own awful uh, treatment. Um, and I think, you know, in the case of Leonora and the, the, um, these places out in the middle of nowhere, that it's our duty to go out to these places and expose some of the, uh, the lies and um, the sort of cover-ups and, um, and just the isolation and break the silence um, on, in these places. Um, and you know, up until 2010, when Rand last went to Leonora, uh, the government was still running the line that there were no children in detention. Uh, and, you know, and it was found that there were actually lots of children in detention right here, we can see them. Um, and so I think that's why the refugee rights campaign in every state has continued to make trips to, uh, to these remote detention. Um, and I think civil disobedience and direct action as well um, can form, has always formed a major part of the refugee rights campaign. Um, these acts and stunts um, can, and, you know, which I think someone will probably go into um, about what we did at the Leonora protest recently, um, but they can demonstrate uh, to refugees and the Australian public and the government that we do not recognise the legality of the imprisonment of refugees. Uh, the legitimacy of the offences, um, nor the authority of Serco and DIA. Um, and so we're not afraid to directly challenge that system um, because we know that the system itself is actually unlawful and unfair and inhumane. Um, and I think that the usefulness of this disobedience goes beyond just that kind of symbolism um, because in the past it's what has pushed the refugee issue into the spotlight um, with you know, major protests like Baxter and Umra. Um, which really sort of reduced the extent to which um, the Howard government could use the uh, refugee issue you know, as a political football. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll finish now. But um, I think the, uh, the campaign should continue to visit these Nora prisons and expose the brutality of the system of indefinite mandatory detention. And only through this and our dedication to direct, defiant actions that challenge the Department of Immigration and Circo's authority can we build a campaign of thousands that can ultimately tear down the fences that keep refugees in prison?
start enjoying great success and enjoying lots of new students even and new young people in. So it's been really um, So uh, after we uh, were eventually, we, we went visiting at, at Leonora and our visits were cut off toward the end. Um, and this was obviously you know, sort of saying, you know, like, all right, there's, there's too many people, they're finding out too much, you know, like, we see a few people here. Um, and so, you know, this was, uh, you know, this made everyone quite angry. Um, and so uh, a decision was made to, on the last night over there, go back to the centre, uh, have a real uh, rousing uh, protest there, and which culminated on uh, many of us uh, climbing up onto the fence to see the young man inside, uh, and quite a few people actually uh, to some high fives. So uh, before they were heard me uh, to the sleep quarters by so um, So all of this uh, is going to be revealed in um, a video of the trip, um, and so it's about ten minutes, uh, and then after that we're going to have a couple of uh, people who are new to campaign speak. Take this through them. You did say you're going to give. Yeah, they yeah, offered. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Circo offered to take a letter. Bring out Steve. Give your letter. Get to those kids. Yeah, Can we watch you give it to them? Because last time we came, these guys like so. ripped them up, put them in the bin, and Diak came in and punished them for it. Well, reprimanded them. So can you please? I'd like to. I'd like you to watch. Watch you walk that letter over to them, we so that we know they get it. They With yeah. Circo, they, they agree. No, I know, but that's all right. They'll as long as they've got it. That's all that matters. As long as they've got it. It's there's a policy where these kids are allowed to receive letters. They're allowed to receive mail. So would you mind walking it over to them? Can I see you go straight straight to them, please? I'd like to see it's the same letter that we've actually sent in, given they've told them that apparently they don't want visits. But the promise you <laughs> said well, well, we could write a letter. If you said we could write a letter. One more after another. <laughs> uh, specifically, I wrote in there we want to visit you, but Circo told us that you didn't want to meet us. when they said that they didn't want to meet us. All the way from Perth, we come a message of peace, we come a, to bring a message that people in the Australian community want to welcome refugees into our community. I did. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Can we come in now? This is yeah, so thank you. I received your letter. We're uh -huh. just getting it translated and then uh -huh. we'll get it distributed to them. Uh-huh. 
Okay. Yeah, they seem to have changed their minds, Eric. Go figure. Jeez, you must feel real good about your negotiating skills that you've talked them into seeing us. And so we really appreciate the fact that earlier you said to us we could go in if they agreed. Yeah, exactly. So that's great. So I received your letter. We're getting it translated for them so that it'll be in all their languages. Um, about the MP3s, do you have 160 MP3s? We don't, no, we have 37. Yeah. I don't know if it's a good idea to sort of fix sure some well, and not others. They know, yeah. Yeah. They know how to share. Yeah. <laughs> a lot better yeah. than your company, I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's happening right now. Can we, um, can we... All day long it's thought control, that dark sarcasm all from Circo. Hey! Can we give him the ball, please? We have a soccer ball for you! Freedom! Hello! Hey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Thank you! Not you, <laughs> Thank you! Oh, dear. <laughs> Freedom! Azadi! Freedom! Azadi! You jeans are welcome here! Go away the king! We won't stop till we free the refugees!
how it can truly change the public opinion because I went from going where I sort of, I won't say I agree with the policy, but, but at least in a scare campaign, I thought I, there must be some validity if I was there saying that it's illegal or whatever, that's a whole other issue. But to show that someone from can completely change their opinion shows that this is an um, there is hope for these people to be locked up. So in relation to the Toledo um, trip itself, basically I hadn't really been acting so much directly and I saw the Facebook event going around. I thought, yeah, this could be fun, go on a road trip, catch up with mates. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, I think this is what really appealed to me was this direct action that as I spoke of previously, I felt that it's my duty and also a right as a citizen of this country to inspect and to physically observe how and scrutinise how these systems are playing out. And I've always been one where I guess I've taken the faith of the government or to a close some sense. And then when I saw first hand accounts, it's not where you can sort of say, oh that might not have happened for a third person's account. This is my direct account. I saw it for myself. And these are just kids that under uh, different circumstances I could be in their situation. And that's what really struck me. That's what really made me sort of wake up. As I said, it was transformative. So the first day's um, interaction with the kids, that was really paramount for me. Um, what I found funny was like, there was such an engulfing mass of security personnel, both police and circuit guards. And it's like a, a small group of citizens, a handful of kids, and kids, basically. And seriously, I, I think sometimes we need to sort of reflect on how um, often the, the debate has really become and that is how we're approaching the situation. So as I said, that this debate is really, I think, through the misrepresentation of uh, information is really sort of a, sort of gone off from what the debate should be around. These are human beings and so I object on both moral, ethical and legal grounds that just the inhumanity of seeing kids or even adults being locked up indefinitely, some for over a year. And then when I personally spoke to them, I found out that they barely getting any um, education. And if you've been locked up there for a year and you can't even speak English, then what's going on? That's, that's one of the issues that I think is just outrageous that if they're eventually going to be coming into our country, which they should be, and becoming part of our society, then what are they doing this time? Should they be trained up? That's like a whole other argument we can take to more monitor some. The one thing that really got to me, I don't want to be too negative to read now, but when I saw physically with my own eyes, I saw the circuit personnel deliberately moving vehicle to block out of you from being able to interact with the um, refugees. That just, it was like a part of my faith just broke there. Like, I guess it, my naivety to think that they're doing something in our best interest. And then to see that just makes you wonder what's going on behind closed doors. But as I said, I don't want to dwell too much on the negative side of this. But I think our actions were very positive. Uh, I especially liked where I just wanted to be able to jump up the fence and that sort of be able to hug up the uh, refugee boys and sort of see that sort of exuberance in their face just light up. You sort of felt like there's a small difference that I could make just in the short term and perhaps there is no concern. And then also in relation to the RAD collective, I felt that. Um, It was very admirable 
how we cooperate and reach um, conclusions to our discussions, particularly on that final day when we are determining what sort of action to take. And I truly thought that was a great sort of example of consensus-based um, democracy where we, were, we truly uh, showed that even in amongst all this negativity, that we can still take the more high ground and do what work out a solution justly. So to conclude, uh, I'm not sure who specifically I should be, should be congratulating, but uh, I'll voice that you made a conversion out of me. <laughs> so yeah, at, at least that's one step along the way and then hopefully we can grow this movement really make a difference to these individual slides.
plans in a cowgirly caravan park. <laughs> we gather to talk about our plans and expectations for the golden day. I must admit, a few doubts and questions had been living about my head, mostly around the effect that the convergence has on the detainees in both the short and long term. I needed to be sure that it would be a positive experience for the refugees and not just for our own benefits, whether personal or political. Could it even be worse to go with welcoming messages to give them some hope and support, only to go away again, leaving them there indefinitely, the situation unchanged? I didn't want to voice these concerns at first, not wanting to play the ignorant detractor. Uh, but the meeting that first night went a long way towards addressing those questions. Uh, the stories of people getting in contact after being released from detention to express their gratitude to RAN, for showing empathy and fighting on their behalf. The stories of information on the conditions and abuses they have suffered whilst in the detention system, smuggled out in secret letters. The stories of the hope restored for people in detention to know that they are welcome in Australia. These stories from the Rand elders <laughs> show, <laughs> show the undeniable good <laughs> done by these goodies. The next day we got into me and Nora and the day and set up a camp at a local airport. Um, incidentally, we managed to kidnap a couple of local kids who were sitting out on their, their big ground group at home. Um, and we joined them to the chorus. <coughs> We made our first journey down the very long, hot and dusty road to the detention centre. Um, I had seen photographs of the centre the night before, um, so I did expect the endless red dirt and the sea of ugly, beige mountains and the, the oppressive heat. And I also expected the intimidating fences surrounding the compound. But I guess what I didn't expect was the rush of claustrophobia um, that I felt when standing right there, seeing it firsthand. Um, yeah, it's, it's a prison. I guess it just it really hit me then. <laughs> yeah, it just hit me then. We're keeping innocent people who have already suffered more than most of us can even imagine um, in a horrible prison instead of giving them the bond to support them that any decent person would give to another person. Um, I guess I already believed in the campaign and in ending that mandatory detention, but I just didn't feel as strongly until I saw it for myself. Um, I guess I just feel that we've already got too many public holidays, you know, and I have to keep adding sorry days to the list. Um, yeah, so it's just a very stark reality, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, I expected all that. I expected a lot of abuse and, and horrible surroundings, but what I, I didn't really count on was Serco lying all the time about everything. Um, I guess I've just grown up believing that authority or will, I guess, even if they do harm things, will manipulate the truth or just avoid the whole situation but not like out and out lie constantly. Um, so that was confronting. Um, made the whole thing seem really surreal. Uh, I also thought there'd be a lot more support services for people, like a lot more counselling. I thought they'd be in school, which they're not. Uh, with not even any uh, English lessons at the time we visited, uh, which I found pretty amazing. I thought that while people were in detention, that we did have programs in place and we did have legal and social support. Um, but yeah, it's not good. Uh, yeah, so that was the first day, and then uh, after much harassing the Serbo guards, they agreed to let us see some kids that they spent three and a half hours finding the few kids that they could convince to come and 
seals. Um, and they decided to stretch it out over the whole day. So we could go in for a time and see the same kids again and again and again over the whole day. It's been like 10 hours of these kids sitting in a room watching you know, one group after the other. The other come in and probably ask the same questions and they're like, why? Why would we do that? Um, and we figured out when we went to the first visit to the next day that they were all uh, Iraqi kids and we asked what the demographic was in the detention centre and the vast majority uh, was uh, kids, kids from Afghanistan and we figured that they were probably uh, only let us see the smaller group so there was a language barrier and uh, more of a, if they could segregate what we said to them um, from the other kids. Uh, so it was all very controlled and contrived and so many guards were in there. Like, we started out with two guards in the first meeting and they gradually worked their way up to like seven or eight and that was very confronting. Um, and we asked them to leave and they were very, very happy with that. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess the whole thing is just really surreal. Um, yeah, so when we exhausted our visits, uh, it was late at night and we didn't really want to, to cause a mass amount of trouble because they had agreed to visits as well as they were. Um, I mean, towards the end, we got to see the other kids because I think word spread through the detention centre and they insisted on seeing people. And uh, once, once they knew we were there to support them, they were really responsive. And, I think that was really very reassuring for me to know that they did want us there. Um, yeah, and then, I don't know if anyone spoke of the tennis balls they were there. Yeah, um, so the, the only part of the, the compound that had one fence, like a single fence, um, separating us from the kids, was the back. And they just happened to be playing soccer that night. And I don't know whether they thought that um, we left on Saturday night or whatever, but it's at all the cops home. And there was like two circle guards on duty and no cops at all. And we walk up and like, we could have just pushed in and like, walked straight through. It was, it was hilarious. I don't know why they It's like, oh, it's five o'clock, we're going to go home. Okay. Um, so we climbed up the fence and started throwing tennis balls over and chanting, and all the kids just all the guys rushed up to the fence and were running up and down and high-fiving us and we were handing over notes and, and all sorts of things and they were just so, like, they were yelling back and, and the enthusiasm was just so amazing and that was the first time I really knew that, that they didn't know what, that, what we were there for and they did appreciate it and they were receptive and everything was so good to say was absolutely bullshit. Um, and yeah, so that was just so invigorating, so exhilarating um, to actually have that response. And we all got back to camp and I don't know, I know for myself, I was like still high on adrenaline and like wanting to go break down some fences or something um, to like work out the, the rest of us, the hype from that night. Um, but yeah, I went to, went to bed. <laughs> yeah, tickled around with my sleep. Um, and got up the next morning and we went to have our last say, say goodbye. And oh, and Juliet told me how to write love and freedom in Arabic. That was on my phone. And we wrote it on all the tennis balls and threw them over. Um, yeah, so the next day we went to say goodbye. We had a sign um, that had everyone's names on it that couldn't make it. And um, so we had our photographs and yeah, we just said goodbye. And, and yeah, we all, we all sort of trickled back towards the bus and that was the first moment that I kind of teared up a bit because, um, yeah, just realising that nothing had changed, that they were still there and that we were going home. Sorry, I'm not usually this emotional. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was really cool, I guess. Um, and we got back to town and, and after being with everyone for so many days and having a 
Like, I think a couple of people were discussing it earlier who've been on trips before about how when it's over, you can feel very isolated and alone because you're with all these people in close contact for quite a few days and you're all focused on the one cause and you're, you know, very caught up in this world that's, that's away from your normal reality and gone off the bus at East Bath and everyone's like, away. I was left with a few people and got back to Perth and was walking around the city by myself and I was like, I'm so alone. Where's all my friends? Um, yeah, so that was a really bizarre feeling, like coming back to reality after being this weird, surreal world of what's, what's reality, um, who's telling the truth, um, what's the actual situation here, and yeah, getting back and getting back used to. to um, normal life. I, you know, I called into bed with my sister and made a couple of new years. <laughs> um, yeah, at the end, I guess, I could really see the benefits in going. Um, I know it certainly cemented my um, dedication and it did, well I hope it gave hope to the refugees. Um, but, and the information that we got in the media coverage and it's bringing it out to more people. So I think it was positive. It's just very confronting. <laughs> That's it. Uh, 
and as the zip of them. And that's when he told me that they had had three community meetings with the young children and young men there, and not one of the 160 wants to see it. And I said, well, that must be a consequence of detention that I had come across professionally before. Because when visiting people in other circumstances, they do want to see visitors just to break the monopoly apart from anything else and have gifts. But that was the way we left it. But when we were protesting at the gate, and those young men, as you saw, saw us and the, the word from down the camp that something was happening, the circle were forced to allow us to visit. And I was in the first group that went in. For, we were allowed to go in to see, it was supposed to be nine young Iraqis in the event of the seven to begin with. Four of us went in. We were to stay for an hour, and then we were to leave again. They had us set up like an official visit where they had a big long table and chairs on each side. Um, when we were seated, the young men came in. And I immediately thought, no, we're not going to sit like this. This is just playing the game, really, with official visits. So we indicated that we wanted to sit in a circle and pull their chairs back and they followed. The seven people didn't have any image, and they were obviously handpicked for reasons that would just make it really difficult to communicate. It never ceased to amaze me how human beings can communicate without language. In the first five or 20 minutes, we were able to work out that they all were Iraqis. They were aged from 14 to 17. Most of them had been at Christmas Island in Darwin. So they had traveled to Australia through the detention center uh, system. They had been told there was a protest coming because Ran made sure and asked Serpent to tell them there was a protest coming. And they did. But they didn't say whether it was for them or against them. Uh, <laughs> so you, these young people were waiting in fearful anticipation and one of the first questions they asked us was the police, what are the police for? So we had to explain to them that the police presence was for us and not them. When the young men first came in, they came in and they presented in a way that I'm really familiar with, detached, down, compliant, complacent. But it never ceases to amaze me when I'm working or dealing with or having the privilege to be with vulnerable people how quickly they're empowered when they recognize your good heart. And with, in a very short period of time, we had this exchange, and they were showing immediate signs they wanted to communicate. And this is where, as Miranda said, they named a young man who had perfect English, Farsi, and Arabic. They, the guards didn't want to say, no, you seven have to stay here, we're not having anyone else in. But they said they wanted to go to the toilet and put so much pressure on that this, uh, this interpreter came in. And that made just the communication that much easier. We able to find out how many were orphans, how many had no parents, how many had family members abroad. Um, and I was just thinking from a developmental point of view, the eldest was 17, the youngest had just turned 14. Now the Iraq invasion was 2003. So the eldest one there was eight when that happened, and the youngest was five. Prior to that happening, there was the awful consequences of the embargo. And that's what these people had been through before they actually started what must have been a horrendous trip, because we didn't, didn't want to get into the details of their actual journey, their exit from Iraq, their whole journey of how they ended up as both people coming into Australia, going to Christmas Island, going to Darwin, and now they ended up in Leonora but what that means for their, for their actual development, not even to think about attachment issues, unaccompanied children. In that whole experience, there was no adult that was there for them, looking after their interests or just comforting them. These are 160 young people, totally alone, having yet another experience that is telling them, you have no work. You have no value. Nobody cares about you being here, and we will call you by number. Now, it's very, very dangerous to tell anyone they've got no worth and no value. But for that to be a repeated experience for them at such a formative time in their life, it's absolutely dangerous for them, but also for those of us who want to live in a society where people are treated with respect and with worth. There were moments of 
last year in Merck, because that's really important too, because we don't want to tell them we want to get one story. <laughs> and that's an unaccompanied, traumatized person who's stuck in the middle of the desert. But in between times, there was very poignant moments where we noticed, for example, evidence of self-harming. But I think the most poignant moment was where a young man looked and he said, Australia, is it worth this? This was before we had the interpreter, so we're talking about pigeon English. And from his demeanor and the way he spoke, I took what he meant was, is it worth struggling to try and stay alive? Is there hope? And it made me think about how I use this when I'm teaching. How about brain falling? You know, as, as uh, mammals, what we share with all mammals is we, we respond to threat and to danger in the same way. And the first response is the brain stem. And sometimes if we're continually having to face threat and danger, we don't get past the brain stem. But if we do, it goes to the emotional brain and then the cortex. But it's the brain stem that is the initial response. And as I say, all mammals share that. And the three responses to threat and danger are flight, fight, and freeze. Now, these kids can't fly, go into flight, they're in lockdown. They're in lockdown with Circa, who by the way were found guilty in the High Court in England last year, in the UK last year, of abusing children in the detention centre. Um, they were using tactics that they call distraction, which was to, drab, to jab them sharply in the nose, in the lungs, and to twist their thumbs back if, um, if they were showing any signs of anger. So they can't go into flight, fight. Now if you've got guards who are using illegal ways of distraction, which is a rather interesting word, then you're more likely to go into self-harm rather than actual aggression. And the last response is freeze. When you can't fight, you can't show aggression, you're limited in how you can self-harm, you can't get out of the situation, you just close down. You go into yourself, the form of sadness, depression, and from what we know is the consequence of the freeze response over time is probably the most dangerous because it's the hardest one to get back out of. So this is not an event, this is a process that is happening in this country that is having lifelong repercussions with these people. They're being emotionally tortured, really. Um, the other thing that struck me was babies aren't born with the knowledge of how to be human. Largely we learn it and we learn it through imitation. Again, what are these young people learning in their life? First five years or eight years of their life, what did they learn in Iraq? What did they learn in the journey? What did they learn when they hit Australia? And now what are they learning of circle guards who um, are calling them by numbers? Just repeat, repeat traumatization and messages, you have no value, you are of no worth. But to see them in power, and as people have said during the day, word got out which totally blew apart the lie of Sir Goziat. Nobody wants to see you, not one of the 160. So we ended up having, I think at one point, there was about 10, 10 or more people just going, because they couldn't control it. They literally just, I think, ended up letting people come into the room because they couldn't control it. And the action that we did that night, I think was so successful because all of those young people had seen how persistent we were to, uh, in our um, challenges to circle, to actually see them and touch base with them in the day. But I think from my point of view, seeing how they responded to our reaching out to them is hugely important because that is an anchor of health for them. That is an anchor of, yes, you do matter. Yes, you have value. Yes, you do have worth. And I've certainly worked with people who have survived the most toxic childhood family experiences. And they have said that one person who believed in me, who reached out to me, made a difference. Now, those young people had maybe 40 of us. And that is a huge memory and it's something to build on. When we had the debrief that night, I just I had an image because I'm very visual of the 
Fidel Castro when they had the huge celebration in Havana for the winning of the revolution and the dove came down and sat on his shoulder and it was a moment of, of great symbolism and meaning, particularly for people who were quite superstitious because the dove is descending and staying on his shoulder and the one. So that became known as the night of the doves. And I said, we just had our night at the tennis balls. <laughs> <laughs> may not be as epic. <laughs> but in terms of what it meant to those of us who witnessed it, and I think just the difference that hopefully it will make to those young people is just as epic. Um, I was just, this is like the video, I was wondering who the whole kind of idiot who was staring at me by the way. Who's that to me? What's that? Because there's a story about that, and really, it was funny, you know, like that. Steve! Steve! Hey! So, this is their comment, yeah. He was the manager of the centre who, when he had thrown the balls over the fence and were high-fiving all the kids, and they finally rounded the kids back up and took them in. And we were like expecting the cops to come up so they didn't come. So we just kept marching around the front and kept shouting even after these kids had gone back in. We thought, okay, so we've got locked down, we better make sure they can hear us. And then up comes Steve, the centre manager, gets in there and he stands up to the gate and he's just, he just stood there and tried to stare us down. It was just the show of authority to any resistance to this system. And you know, this to be done to us, people who can't be in the border who aren't a threat of you know, taking a visa away from us, who are adults who are born here and you know, have a place here. This is how we get treated when there's a bit of resistance. Imagine when you're a, like someone with no power behind you, locked up in that centre, a child who's just desperately sitting here waiting for a visa so they can get themselves and their families safe. And this is the kind of power that we maniac they have got running in the centre. So that was Steve, the centre manager. Can I just say very briefly, I meant to say, you saw the picture of the kids as they were being hurled back. That was the recreation area. There were 160 young people in that detention centre. One of them told us he had been out once to the swimming pool. They didn't know what the, what the time was. They didn't know the old walk that we were camping in around the corner. They are locked down. And that was the space, recreational space for 160. And we should point out that that one recreational space, which is the soccer field, actually has another fence between the soccer field and the centre. So unless the guards let them out to that soccer field, they're not free to go out there. They can only go out there with permission. All right, we'll be, yeah, we'll be trying to